Hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here. My name is Brian Horgan. Um, I mainly do character rigging and uh, animation in cinema. I work as a freelancer. And um, I have a lot to cover today, so rather than kind of show a reel of my stuff, I'm just going to dive right in and um, I will show some examples though um, uh, to illustrate some of the stuff we're going to be talking about as we're going on. So I'll show some examples of things I've animated. So I'm going to dive in. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to rig a character using the new uh, character tools in Nord 13. And uh, I've actually, Cinema ships with several uh, templates, but I've actually um, created my own one that we're going to use. It's a slightly simplified one. I'm actually going to filter and show the uh, joints here. So this is our character template. Um, basically what you do to install this is you load it up just like as you, as you would with a normal cinema file. And then you go to the character menu here, character builder, save character template as. And it'll open up your um, library folder, with the which has a new folder in it now in R13 called characters. And it'll uh, save it in there. I've already got it saved in there, so I'm not going to do it again. But And that's all you do to install it. I can just close this then. And um, now when you create a character object, that template will be available. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to load in our unrigged character. So this is um, this is our character here. He's uh, called Alan. It's a very simple little rig. If I turn off the hyper nerves. And you can see his mesh there is very low poly. It's less than a thousand um, polys altogether. And um, I think we really recommend starting off with something like that if you're new to rigging. Um, Especially with the weighting process, um, you know, skinning the characters to joints, it's it's always going to be tricky when you're starting off, but it's definitely going to be easier if you start with something really kind of low detail like this. So I've got a couple of layers set up in this file. I've got uh, one for its meshes. I'm going to use the layers um, manager here. You can get it from the Windows, uh, where is it? Uh, layer manager here. You can get it from the drop down list here or it's part of the interface now in R13. And uh, I'm gonna just use a little lock icon here, which means I can't select the, uh, the meshes as I'm, as I'm working. And I'm gonna to go to the character menu here and just select this character object. And that's gonna add this new object to our scene then, the character object. And uh, you can see you've got, if you go to this, uh, the first tab here, the build, you've got these different templates. And the one we want is that one we just added in, the Allen rig. And uh, when I select that, then I get these various options I can choose. The first one is a pelvis. I'm going to add that. And when I add that, it creates uh, this, this master mover control and a pelvis control and a joint here at the, at the root of the character. Then I'm going to add a spline IK for spine. Um, then I'm going to add his legs. You can actually, there's a couple of handy hotkeys here you can use. If you hold shift and control, it'll, it'll create both of them at the same time. And it'll also keep the selection on the spine. So I'm going to hold those and press that. And you can see I've got both legs now. And it's still selecting the spine here. So now I can add the last component, which is a stretchy head, which is uh, kind of an unusual feature you wouldn't have in a regular biped. But in a cartoony character like this, I guess he's influenced by stuff like Aardman and the Muppets and things like that. Um, it'll give us a little bit more flexibility. And um, and that's our rig added, but we need to adjust it a little bit to fit the character. I'm going to press NA, or sorry, actually NB to see the... Um, the lines you can see there that it's mostly lined up pretty well but not not 100 percent. so i'm going to go to the adjust tab here and you can see when i do that then we get the uh, this display changes a little bit we get these uh these little uh control objects we can hover over that allows to move the the rig itself i'm going to go into a front view and i'm going to zoom out a little bit and usually what i do is i, I position the, the uh the pelvis first. If I right click on it, actually, you'll see there's a couple of different controls I can select. I'm going to select the uh, the root null, and I'm actually going to move it down a little bit, give him very low slung hips, and I'm going to then I'm going to grab this left leg one and move that over here maybe a little bit, kind of lining it up with the middle of the knee. Move that move it down a little bit. And I'm going to go into a side view, and I'm going to sort of position the legs a little bit better. I'm actually going to move the pelvis back slightly as well in Z. If I select, hover over this again. Um, you can see I got a right click. I'm going to make sure I set the root rather than the hips one because that'll move everything with us. I'm going to just bring it back a little bit just to line up with this edge loop here. I might bring the legs forward a tiny bit. And then if you look at the knee, you can see we've got this loop running right away through the middle of the leg. So I'm going to kind of line this up with that. I'm going to bring it back a little bit from the front, but I'm going to keep it definitely in front of this. And then I'm going to grab the uh, the foot, 
I'm going to bring that down here, position it, say, roughly around here. And this one will determine where the ball of foot is. I'm going to put it on the ground, pretty much, um, but kind of lined up with this loop here. And then this one will affect where the toe is positioned on the ground. It'll, it'll be where his foot pivots off the ground, so I'm going to put it again on the ground. And I've got one last control here, and this will determine where the heel pivots from. So I'm going to move that, put it on the ground again, and put it back around here somewhere. And if I go into, um, I'm actually going to adjust a couple more ones while I'm here. I'm going to adjust the spine, maybe move it up just, just a little bit, and then the, uh, the head control, I'm going to move it right up to the top. Uh, and you'll see what by adjusting the um, left leg there, everything's mirrored over to the right. So that's pretty much our rig setup. I'm going to go back to the build mode. One thing, though, I would like to do is I would like to uh, make the uh, feet controllers a little bit more visible there, hidden a little bit by the mesh. So I'm going to go back to adjust mode and go to controllers. And I'm going to make sure I'm in the model tool mode. I'm going to select his left foot controller and I'm going to select the scale tool and I'm just going to scale it out a little bit and again you'll see it's mirroring across and I can actually position that a little bit something like that just make it a little bit easier to, um, to select go back to the character tag go back to the build mode and, uh, and that's all looking good and uh, to bind then I'm actually just going to unlock the mesh layer again so when we open the bind tab we've got this empty field here which basically we just drag the mesh into and you'll see it automatically adds a skin deformer and it adds a weight tag with all the joints added into it and uh, and that's our character rig basically one thing we need to look at though is getting his eyes and his horns to follow along with the rig so that's one situation where I'm going to open up the hierarchy a little bit you'll see with the the R13 character object it, it kind of it simplifies the the object manager a little bit you've got this things are listed as components rather than uh, all the objects that make up the rig but in this case you want to see them just for a moment so I'm going to go to the character tab again and I'm going to go to the display tab and this manages one that's usually folded up by default but I'm going to select that and I'm going to change it from components to full hierarchy that's going to show me the entire rig so I'm going to close up these make that a little bit neater I don't need to see the spine but I do need to see the head I think it's head four, yeah, head four. I'm gonna go back to object mode. It's kind of an. There's a few different ways you can approach attaching the eyes and the horns to the mesh, but in this way, I'm gonna just just keep it very simple. I'm just gonna constrain them to this joint. Um, people often use uh, naturally kind of go for a, a parent constraint for this kind of stuff, but I find um, using a PSR constraint is a little bit more stable. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, drag these objects out from underneath. I've got this head objects root, which basically. Uh, I move that around you'll see it contains all these different objects so I'm, but I'm going to take these out of there for a moment just unparent them then I'm going to select the head objects select that head four joint go to character constrain um, add PSR constraint and you'll see that head object null now has jumped into position um, and it's going to follow along with that joint so now I can just grab these and put them back under there as children of that uh, root null and now if I go to the character object again i can switch the display back to i might actually go to controllers i find that's a nice one because you can actually see all the different controllers in the rig and i'm going to uh the other tag i'm going to switch to animate and um that's basically our character rigged really you can uh you can see there what i mean about this squash and stretch head he's got um you know, this this bottom controller here will, will affect his whole body this one here will affect his his hips and his chest and his feet are actually got, got got some nice options on them actually if you can select this foot controller here and we go to the controls tab you can see we've got um a knee twist affecting his knee direction a toe twist uh foot roll that will roll him forward on, on his bulbous foot and then lift him up on a toe and then a heel and then a toe wriggle will make his toe kind of flap as he walks we've also got individual controls then for a ball lift heel lift and toe lift they give a little bit more control but often i find the foot roll is enough we've also got some options here for stretchy leg we can squash his leg uh we can scale it make it longer and uh, we can make we can bias whether that length happens on the upper or the lower part of the leg and we can just reset everything back to the default and uh, the other handy thing about the character object as well is it creates a bind pose so we can just go to the animate tab and press reset pose and it resets everything back to the default pose. 
So that's a character rigged. But you'll notice as I'm moving some of the controllers around, the, uh, the, the deformations in the upper body, they're not too bad. You know, most of this looks reasonable. But down around here, we've got some pretty messy areas. So I'm going to just jump to a new scene. I'm going to close this one. And I'm going to open uh, this one, which is the weights start scene. This is basically the same scene, really, again, but um, it's just a starting point for doing the waiting. So what I like to do with waiting, I'm going to kind of use the old cookery show trick of kind of skipping forward a little bit here and there to um, files that I've already finished just to speed things up. But the, ascent, the basics of my, of my usual workflow, there really are lots of different ways you can approach it. But my usual workflow is to kind of block in things in absolute values first and then smooth it out. So the, um, the, the upper body, as I said, is, is pretty decent. I don't think we need to do too much work there. Um, but the lower part of the body, particularly if I move this uh, hips control here, you'll see some of this deformation here is definitely not looking good. If I turn off the hyper nerves, you can sort of see the, the poly is a little bit clearer. I'm actually going to press NB again to get the, the lines showing. So you can see there, it's obviously uh, some, some stuff not working here. So really, it's quite simple. What's happening there is um, if I select the... Uh, the skin tag, if I double click on that, it opens the weight tool. And as I select um, each joint, actually, a nice option now you can actually change the order these are displayed in. I'm going to switch it to hierarchy. So it kind of gives you a better impression of how the, uh, the joints are related to each, to each other. And um, if I select the hip joint, you'll see it's affecting far too much of this area here, which is why we're getting those bad deformations. And uh, the, the tendency, the tendency thing might be to. Um, to delete those weights from this, but actually I find it's a little bit more stable um, if you actually add them to the, to the correct joint rather than subtracting them. It just, um, th there's a concept that we, I would rate and call normalization, which means that every point on a mesh has to be weighed 100% to, um, at, le to at least one joint that can be weighed to 70% you know, to one and 30% to another and so on. But they, um, they have to be weighed 100 percent in total and that's what they call normalized weighting and it, it'll happen automatically as you as you paint the weights if you have this option on but if you subtract weights sometimes they'll get distributed in ways that isn't predictable so what i like to do is kind of go in and specify exactly uh where i want them so what i'm going to do this time is i'm going to double click this again but i'm going to hold shift and that'll open up a new interface uh, this is new in r12 um called a weights manager and uh, it's kind of similar to the weights tool in a way, but it allows you to do some extra functions. Uh, it allows you to work in sort of um, a sort of slightly more technical way, I suppose, in some ways, but you can sort of see a little bit better what you're doing. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the, the, the mesh. I'm going to go to, to edge mode. I'm going to press U and then L, which will put me into loop selection mode. And I'm going to select the um, a loop here that's kind of giving us problems. I'm going to select a joint that I want to associate it to. So that, that root of the spine there, I want that to be controlling. You, see, you can see it's controlling these points in the middle and probably some on his, on his rear end here. But I want it to control all of these ones in the middle as well. So I'm going to turn the strength up to 100%. I'm going to change the mode to abs, which means absolute. And um, I'm going to press apply. And you can see now it's added those. It's If I hover over those now, they're all weighed 100% to that joint. And I'm going to do the same. I'm going to select the next joint here. And again, it's roughly lining up with this loop here. So I'm going to select that loop and I'll do the same thing. Again, it's affecting most of the ones that I want, but not these ones on the side. So I'm going to apply again. And I might go up one further one. And that looks pretty good, but just to be sure, I'm going to, to um, apply again. You can see some of those got cleaned up a little bit there. So now when I select the hip joint, you'll see I can select the right or the left one. You can see it's affecting a lot less of that mesh. And in fact, I'm going to actually select this loop down here as well and weigh it to that one which is going to give us a fairly rigid looking transition now between the the hip and the thigh i'm also going to do some of this kind of stuff on the foot so i'm going to go to the toe joint and i know for example that this loop here this one here this one here. oops not that one this one here i'm holding shift to kind of add those in uh, i want those all to weight 100 percent to this um to this toe joint so i'm going to press apply you can see it just clean it up a little bit. I'm going to do the same on the left foot, or the right foot, sorry. You can mirror the weights across, but sometimes I find on a simple character like this, it's almost just as quick to just do them, do them like this. So again, I'm just going to weigh those to that. And then I'm going to do the same kind of thing for the foot. I want this loop here, 
and this loop to be weighed 100 percent of the foot apply and, and then there's a few other points here that won't fall into a handy loop so what i can do is i can just use the normal weight tool so i close that actually i'm going to do the other foot as well with those same loops just to kind of block that in so i'm going to go to the right foot and apply and now i'm going to close this for a second and go back to the normal weight tool by double clicking on this and i'm going to go to the left foot i'm going to make sure that visible only is switched on so i don't paint through the mesh i'm going to leave it on 100 percent and absolute i'm going to just paint these verts here with 100 percent. you can see one there was kind of a little bit darker so it wasn't controlled 100 percent by that weighting i do the same with the right foot again most of these are going to be fine but there's that dark one there let's make sure these are all 100 percent so really what I'm doing is I'm kind of blocking in with absolute values because I know that that's going to give me uh, predictable results and then I can smooth the results then a little bit later. So I'm going to just, uh, again, I'm going to open the, the, the weights manager, I'm going to hold shift and double click. And then I'm going to look at, say, the knee. So I want, I'm going to go back to, to loop mode, UL. Um, I want this uh, to be affected by the knee 100%, so I'm going to apply. And now this loop here in the middle I want this to be affected uh, pretty much 50% by this joint and 50% by the hip joint because it's right in the middle of them. But I'm going to um, actually set it up to, to be 100% first and then I'm going to add 50% to this one. And again, that's I find that gives more predictable results. So I'm going to change this to 50%. I'm going to hold Alt actually, which will constrain it to units of 10 degrees. And I'm going to press Apply. So now I've got 50% there. I'll go back to the knee. You'll see I've got 50% on that. I just find that gives a little bit more predictable results. <coughs> Excuse me. And then I'm going to go to this loop here. I'm going to set that to 100% and apply. Uh, whoops, sorry, I wanted that to the uh, hip. I'm just undoing that. So I want this one. And then I'm going to do the same thing for the other one. I'm going to the right knee. I want this loop to be 100%. I'm going to set this one up to 100% to begin with. And then I'm going to select the hip and change it to 50% apply and then this one 100 percent and now f from here on really it's a matter of refining and this is where i would do some manual painting um, and what i generally do is i go into object mode again and i would select say um back to object mode and select say the the, uh, the pelvis controller of the character and you can see there as i move them left to right it's working pretty well but some of the some of the transitions here are looking a little bit rough so what i generally do is i am just going to turn off position and rotation for record there i'm going to just add a keyframe in the default position on frame one then go forward a few frames say to the last frame here and then just drag them over to where it's i'm starting to get that bad deformation maybe bring it over a little bit further and then keyframe it there and it just means now i can kind of scrub back and forward and see how the deformation is working and really to clean that up then i generally find i use the weight tool uh, but I switch to smooth mode, and the smooth mode will kind of um, uh, kind of blend the weights out a little bit. But what I generally do is I kind of go back. I set this to maybe around 50%, and I tend to go back and forward between usually two joints, like between the hip and the spine zero. You can see there the transition is a little bit hard, so I'm going to kind of soften it a little bit like this. And that uh, this is bit where it's kind of a little bit more artistic than technical you know you kind of you're really working off what looks good um you know what makes your, your character deform nicely you know um i'm gonna kind of blend in the weights in a little bit here and then I'll go back to the hip and again just really what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to get the polys to kind of even out sideways size wise so that so the deformations look good and uh, this takes a little while to do, so I'm going to kind of skip ahead a little bit. I'm going to open um, another file here where I've got the weights done. And uh, you'll see in this one now, it's it's not, not perfect, you know, but it's a lot, lot cleaner than it was. When I move his feet now, you know, you can see he's, I can use the controls on his feet. Knee twist, toe twist, and all the other controls are working. And, uh, and that's our character ready to animate. And um, 
we can animate them by hand or we can use the sea motion system. Um, but I'm going to take a little break from this guy for a little bit. We're just going to look at another little rigging concept. And then we're going to come back to uh, some animation principles and uh, actually getting this guy walking around. So I'm going to close all my files here just to save a bit of RAM. And I'm going to open an example file here. Um, this is a um, basic concept here I want to demonstrate uh, about piping deformations from one mesh to another. So I'm just going to, I've got a simple scene file. I'm actually going to build this again from scratch. Um, all I've got really is, uh, this was a sphere, which I made editable, so it's just a mesh now. And I've added um, a bend deformer to it, and now I can um, deform it using that bend deformer. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually copy this mesh, and I'm going to rename this one Render Mesh. And I'm going to delete the deformer, I'm going to bring it out here a little bit so it's a bit easier to see. And um, this concept, if you've ever read the book uh, Stop Staring by Jason Osipa, he demonstrates this in it, and it's um, a very simple concept really, but it's very, very um, powerful really for, for all sorts of purposes in rigging and animation. And um, it's basically this idea of, of having one object uh, point drive another one. And I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to just right-click this render mesh object and go to character tags, uh, pose morph. I'm going to choose points. I'm going to delete. It adds one by default. I'm going to delete that one. I'm going to drag in the deform mesh as a morph target. And it gives me this option, which is a little bit confusing. It says, as deformed morph deform mesh as an absolute or a relative morph target. And uh, the way I like to think about this is an absolute target will always look back at what this mesh is doing. So it'll kind of update it as this mesh updates. Whereas a relative one will just look at the current state of it, make that a target, and and that's it. Then you could actually delete this object, you know. Um, so for this purpose, we need to use uh, the absolute. So I'm going to say yes. And I'm going to go to that that object and uh, that, that morph rather and make sure go to animate mode make sure it's turned up 100 percent the other thing i need to do is just adjust the priorities on this so i'm going to go to the basic tab and change this to generators that'll make sure it solves after the deformer on the other mesh and um, the result of that then if i go to the bend deformer i can actually adjust the bend and you'll see it's actually affecting the other mesh and the the handy thing about this is that I can I can move this mesh completely independently. I can rotate it or scale it or do anything like that. But the um, whatever I do to this other mesh will get piped through using the deformation. And obviously this is a very simple example. And um, you know you might be wondering, well, what's the practical use of this? But it really has a lot of different uses. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of how you could use this. Um, this is an um, example with say the Allen mesh again. And here I've done basically the same thing. I've got the rig here. This is actually our Allen rig. Uh, you can see the controllers here are active. If I select these, I can uh, pose them around and so on. And I've got them looking at the ground over here. And uh, this is a duplicate mesh then, like we did with the uh, with the sphere. And this one has got a squash and stretch deformer on it. And uh, just a couple of points about setting this up. I actually find it works better if I use a morph deformer on the, on the mesh to, to transfer the the morph across and I also find that you need to when you go to the, the morph tag you need to make sure it's using correctional that means that it's um, it's solving after the skin deformer it's going to look at the current state of the skin deformer and add it on top if you have it just on the regular absolute or relative modes it won't work so you need to make sure it's on correctional if you go back to animate and I've just make sure it's up at 100% and now it means that whatever I do to this mesh will transfer but it'll transfer in what they call pose space. Because see, this guy, his spine is kind of curved over. If I squash and stretch this guy by just in the factor parameter here, you'll see it's actually affecting. This is kind of an earlier version of the rig. His weighting isn't very good there, but you can see the um, how it's affecting the mesh in a really sort of uh, nice way. You've got the the squash and stretch is, is acting just up and down on this mesh, but it's acting along the joint chain there because. Um, because it's uh, in using that correctional type. So it means you can rig this up, you know, rather than trying to get a squash and stretch deformer to follow along with the spine and to, to follow the curvature that you that you create when you move these controllers around, you could actually just use some espresso to kind of rig the, the length of the chain up to the squash and stretch. Like the skin deformer has a squash and stretch built in, but for cartoony characters, 
you often want to push it a lot further. So this will give you an option, and again, I'll show you a couple of other examples of using this. Here's another one where I've got the same setup again, but this time I've added um, a cloth tab or tag to the uh, to the duplicate mesh. So if I press play now, you see this is a piece of cloth now, and it's actually affecting our our skin, the character. And again, I can move him around, but he's now acting like a piece of cloth. And you can actually use this for blending different cloth sims together and all, all sorts of purposes like that. And I'll show you one more example. Um, there's really endless ways you can use this, but just to show you the concepts, this is another example where I've got a, a cape, uh, or a very simplified cape, and again I've got a cloth. Uh, this one is a little bit more of a complicated setup, so I won't go through the whole thing. But um, basically I, I can now move this around, I can pose it, and I've actually got these joints in there as well. If I double click this selection object, I can actually, can, I can actually pose this cape, um, but I'm still getting that nice cloth effect. So I get sort of a um, a mixture of cloth and being able to pose it, which is really nice for your, you know, kind of superhero characters. And so that's just a couple of examples. I say really it's the kind of thing that the more you look at this, you can see more ways you can apply it. So I really encourage people to play around with that. So again, I'm just going to close all my scenes again just to save a bit of memory here. And I'm going to going to look at some animation principles. Um, I'm going to look at um, this one. And I'm also going to look at uh, this one. So I'm going to look at the overlap one first. So um, animation is a little bit like music in that, you know, if you've never played an instrument before, you can pick up a guitar and start plucking away at the strings in a random sort of way. And if you have a musical ear, you could probably get something out of it, but it would probably be quite a slow process. Whereas if somebody was to show you a couple of chord shapes and, you know, teach you a couple of scales, you'd get results a lot quicker. And it's the same kind of thing with animation. Um, but it's a little bit daunting when they're starting off because there's a lot of terminology people throw around them. One of them is this concept of uh, key poses and breakdown poses. So I'm going to, and then other concepts like drag and overlap. I'm going to demonstrate that here with a very simple scene. So I've got this um, simple joint chain here. I've got blue, red, and green joints. These are set to um, box display type just to make them a little bit more visible. And I'm going to just turn off position and scale for uh, keyframing. I'm going to switch to rotation. I'm gonna just I'm gonna hold shift actually to constrain this. I'm gonna go uh sixty degrees here in this direction. I'm gonna keyframe it, then I'm gonna to go to frame twenty-five and keyframe it again, and then frame thirteen. I'm gonna keyframe it the other way. I'm gonna go hundred and actually oops, I'm gonna do that again. Holding the shift, I'm gonna to... try that once more. Make sure I think you need to start moving and then hold shift. Yeah, that's it. Make sure I'm, I'm going to go 120 degrees, and I'm actually going to switch my my um, keyframe type. If I press Control D, I bring up the uh, project settings. I'm going to switch the key interpolation to linear. And I'm going to select actually those keys on that, and make sure they're linear as well. So now, if I press play, you'll see I've got this very simple motion of the car of the character, <laughs> the joint, really, just going back and forward. And if I was animating, um, a windscreen wiper, well, you know, job done, you know, but I want something a little more interesting than this. So I'm going to keyframe these two joints as well on this first frame and on the 13th frame and on the 25th frame. And, uh, you know, that doesn't change anything for the moment because they're just uh, zeroed out. But I'm going to go halfway between, and basically when people talk about key poses. Key poses are the ones that you need to have in there to get the story points across like so you know this there's not much of a story to this but you can see that we've got this it's facing this direction then it's facing this direction so you could say that these are the two key poses and the last one then is just the first key again just to kind of loop it um but the uh the breakdown poses then are the ones that kind of determine the flavor of the motion one way i've heard it put which i think is a good way to explain it is if the key poses describe what happens the breakdown poses describe how that happens so at the moment, the break, you know, there's nothing really interesting happening. It's just a linear transition. So I'm going to go to frame seven, and I'm going to bend this one back. I'm actually going to put on auto key so I can do this, and it'll set keys as I'm going along. So I'm going to hold shift. I'm going to go back, say, 25 degrees with this one, and maybe 35 with this one. And then I'm going to go to frame 19. I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to select this one, go back 25, and this one. 35 
And now if I press play, you see I've got a much more interesting motion. I've got this sort of sense that this is a sort of like more of a floppy sort of tail. And really, that's that's the thing about um, breakdowns. It, this pose here on frame seven would be a breakdown because it's kind of describing how the transitions are happening. Like, and it's also putting in some drag, and you could consider this an overlap as it comes back. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to push that further. The other thing you'll hear people talking a lot about in animation as well is favoring a particular key. So these poses, you could say, are favoring this key because they're kind of pointing back towards that one. Whereas this one right now is kind of neutral. It's just kind of halfway between the, the first and the, 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 the last key. But I'm actually going to favor the next key. I'm going to push it forward maybe, say, 20 degrees. So now this one is favoring the next key, so which means it's more like this key. And that's going to push these back further, maybe another 10 degrees each. Um, actually, maybe 15 on this one. And I'm going to do the opposite then on this key. I'm going to push this one forward. 20. And back 10, say, and back 15. And now you see i got a different motion again, a very sort of floppy sort of motion. And these are still linear keys. If I open up the timeline, you can see that the... Uh, the keyframes are actually just completely linear. There's, there's no smoothing there. You know, if I switch these to spline and polish them up, we get a nicer movement again. But I think there's enough there to demonstrate what I'm talking about. Um, that we've basically by um, by adding in this breakdown pose and by dragging back and you know or pushing forward the some of the elements, we've added a lot more fluidity. But the main point I wanted to make is that I haven't actually changed the key pose at all. Frame one and frame thirteen and, and twenty five are are exactly the same so it's the really the key poses that are just kind of blocking things in but the, the breakdown poses are, are really the ones that um that kind of give you the flavor of the motion so i'm going to show one more example of this um this would be um loman uh rig i'm just going to open up um, actually I'll open up the start file and this is showing really the same kind of concept in this file i've got him set up so he's just bobbing up and down it's just his his um basically his body is, is just the only thing animated really at the moment so he's bobbing up and down as if he's walking and it's, but the motion is very very stiff and uh, i don't have time to obviously polish this whole thing and uh, add a lot of detail but just to show one example of how you can use the same concept uh, of breakdown poses so the the his root controller is keyed on frame one frame seven and frame 13. so i'm going to keyframe his head on those same frames this time i just want to keyframe the rotation keyframe one seven and 13 so i'm just block i'm just locking in those those poses really then i'm going to go halfway through say frame four and again i'm going to put on auto key to make it a little bit easier and uh, you can see his body is moving down at this point so i'm going to drag his head back as if he's kind of you know it's lagging from where he came from and then on this frame here is frame 10 He's kind of halfway between coming down and coming back up again. I'm going to go the opposite way. I'm going to drag it down. If I press play now, you can see the motion's a little bit ragged because it's it's just got linear keys at the moment. I'm actually going to bring up my um, uh, timeline. And I'm going to start this head controller. I'm going to just only show animated. And the uh, rotation P is what I want. And you can see the curve there. Um, it's, it's just a linear curve. So I'm going to switch it to a spline. But one thing that happens when you switch the spline is you get these kind of uh, easing on the first and last frames, which I don't actually want. A good way to kind of visualize this is to go to before and switch it to, to repeat before and after, repeat after. And now when I start that that uh, F curve, you can sort of see why it would look um, jerky if I played it back now, because they've got this kind of uh, oh, like a kink, if you like, in the spline. So I'm going to select the first one and the last one. I'm just going to adjust the tangent here just to get a smooth transition through and I'm going to just round this off here a little bit like that as well. And I, I could also grab these two, maybe stretch them out a little bit just to kind of sort of favor those those poses. And now if I press play I should, I'm going to actually just change it to frame 12 playback so I don't get the repeat of the last frame. So now I get a much smoother motion. And it's it's pretty exaggerated here, you know, most of us don't bob our heads that much when we walk but you know for a cartoony character it might be definitely appropriate. But you can see, without, I haven't animated the spine at all yet. You could do the same thing with the rotation of the spine. Um, you know, drag it down as he's coming up and drag it back as he's coming down. 
And it really goes a long way to adding flexibility to the character. So the last thing I want to look at is just the concept of spacing. And this is another principle, um, <coughs> excuse me, this is another principle um, you'll see animators talking about a lot. Um, it's basically a concept of timing and spacing, and timing really is how long an action takes. Spacing is how that action is spread out through the frame. So I'm going to just grab these three. I'm just going to keyframe the position. This time I'm going to keyframe them at position at frame one. And then I go to frame 25. I'm going to drag them over here and keyframe them again. And I'm going to go into the timeline then. And I'm going to switch the um, the red one to it's position Z. I'm keyframing in this case to linear keys. And now the red one will have a linear key, and the the green and blue ones will have uh, spline keys. So these will have a slight ease that they'll kind of start off slowly and then fade in slowly. But the thing about the the default easing in in any three D program is it's fairly boring to look at. You know, it's it's fine for things like camera moves and stuff like that maybe, but. But if you want sort of more dramatic, sort of dynamic movement, particularly for characters, generally you need to kind of put in a little bit more work to kind of make the um, what, the spacing basically more interesting. So you can see the first one there is the most dull, if you like, it's got this linear transition, it's, it, there's no acceleration at all. These two start off slowly and then kind of speed up, but there is, it's a very smooth transition, it's not particularly natural looking. So I'm going to take the blue one, I'm going to go to frame 9, and I'm going to grab this one, I'm going to go to... Um, all the key again. And I'm going to push it back so that it's more like the first pose. And then I'm going to go to frame, say, frame, say, 19, 18, 19. And I'm going to, maybe even earlier, frame 17, I'm going to pu push this one forward so it's more like the last one. And now you're getting a much more interesting motion. It's taking him quite a while to get to this point, so the, so the acceleration is a lot slower at the beginning, and then he flies through the middle much quicker, and then a lot slower at the end. And you can see now, the, you know, the, the motion of the, th of the three of them, the blue one is definitely the most interesting, it kind of looks like it's motivated by something, whereas this green one, you know, it's smooth but mechanical, whereas the blue, or the red one is just a purely mechanical movement, there's no um, acceleration or deceleration to it. And it's a simple concept, but you'll see this used all over the place, really, with character animation, particularly with things like um, when a character's swinging their arms. If you think about a pendulum, a pendulum will always swing much faster through the middle of its swing and kind of slower at each end. So there are just a couple of concepts, um, so a little bit of animation theory, I suppose, and um, a little bit of work with uh, demonstrating with cinema. So again, I'm just going to close all my files. And now we're going to get on to actually doing a walk cycle with our, our character, Alan. So I'm going to just open this C motion start file. And um, I don't, you know, unfortunately, within the time we have, I don't really have the time to, to, to do a fully polished walk with this, but I'm going to just show the basic concepts. A lot of the the, the uh, technical side of this has been covered by um, a lot of the, the live presentations on Cineversity. So I, I don't want to do too much repetition on what they've already done. I want to kind of just give an overview of getting things started and then maybe have a look at some anim some walks and things I have animated um, with just a couple of points that, that will help um, when you're when you're animating a walk either using C-Motion or just doing it by, by hand if you like by using yeah, regular keyframes <coughs> excuse me so I'm going to select the character object and I'm going to go to the object tab and you'll see I've got this option here to add a walk and depending on how your character template is set up It'll it'll add more or less to the rig. In this case, it's only really just going to slide the, the feet forward and back. So I'm going to add a little bit more to that. I'm going to go to the C Motion tab, and I'm going to go to the Object tab. And um, very simple to add um, to add uh, actions. What they what they call it here in this case, you can almost think about these as kind of poses or or different you know like F curves basically in a timeline. And uh, what I want is really, I'm going to select the pelvis. I'm going to, the first action we have by default is uh, lift P, Y, or position Y. And I'm going to add that. And you can see as soon as I add that now, it's changed the motion of it a little bit. He's now lifting up and down. And I can select that then, and I can change how much it affects. So I'm going to maybe bring it up a little bit and give it more of a bouncy sort of feel. And I'm also going to rename it. If I double-click on this, I can actually rename this. 
we name it body up down. I find that's handy to do as you're doing this because it's it's a little bit abstract looking at this interface sometimes and trying to figure out what's driving what. So I find sometimes it's just renaming things as you go along it makes things a little bit easier to deal with. And um, the, the the motion, the, the style of the motion is being determined really by this curve. So I'm actually going to open this in a separate video, uh, window. There's an option there to do that. So it's, we've got a little bit more room here to adjust the keys. And a couple of handy options you can you can use are you can right click on this and um, link end tangents and link end positions. And that means that if you adjust one of these, uh, it'll adjust the other one, which will keep the cycle smooth. It means you won't get a hitch in the motion. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select all of these and I'm going to go to point types soft, and that'll give me um, these handles that I can adjust very much like the keyframes in the in the timeline. I'm going to flatten these ones out. And the thing about the motion is, it's by default it just creates a sine curve. And one of the one of the things people were saying on the, on the forums about the C motion system was um, all the motion looks very mechanical. Things like that. Well, it will because it's you know a sine curve is a pretty mechanical sort of motion, and in real life we don't really move like that. You know we've got things like gravity, inertia, and muscles, and all these different things that are driving our motion. So what I'm going to do just to make this look a little bit more interesting. I'm going to grab these. I'm going to stretch the handles out, and that means now it's going to favor the top part of the of the the curve, so it's going to spend more time in the upper, it's going to slow into the up position and slow back down again. I can actually even push that further. If you're animating something like a bouncing ball, you might do this, you might make this tangent really small so that it really hits. It's a little bit unnatural here for for this purpose. I'm going to make both of them like that, so you can see. Now you can see he's kind of like bouncing off the ground, almost like he's hitting the ground on each, on each uh, descent. Obviously for a character that that's not exactly what you want, but for something like a bouncing ball, it would be uh, give you that more natural sort of movement. But I'm going to just go with that. I'm also going to add a little bit of side to side. I'm going to shift position X. Uh, oh, sorry, I need to select the pelvis, shift position X and add. And there you go. And I'm also going to maybe add a little bit of uh, twist rotation Y. So now he's twisting as he's moving along. And the other thing we need to do um, is to look at his feet, because right now they're just sliding back and forward, which isn't particularly interesting. So I'm going to concentrate on one foot. I'm going to select his left leg, and I'm going to add a position Y. And now you can see he's lifting his foot up as he as he walks along, but it's not really enough. So I'm going to select the um, that position Y, and I'm going to change it to maybe maybe around twenty. I'm going to call that lift. Leg lift, something like that. Might make it a little bit more. Bring up to say around 20. Probably go a bit further than that, even. Yeah, that's not looking too bad. You can go further. Again, this is where you read, really kind of decide, you know, what kind of character is this? Like, what's his personality? You know, if he's a kind of a sad, and even what's his mood in this particular scene you're animating? If he's, you know, sad, he's probably going to drag his feet, whereas if he's optimistic and happy, he's going to probably raise his feet up a lot. That's really the art side of um, you know animation, um, really, you know kind of thinking about your character and thinking about the scene that he's in and what he's going to do. Um, but the one thing we we'll notice at the moment is that his feet are staying completely level as he's lifting them up, which doesn't look very natural. But if I um, if I select his left leg again and go to the options, you'll see that the uh, any of the user data options um, that are on his foot. Are, these are um, going to appear here as well. So I'm going to select the foot roll one. And um, by default, or sorry, I've got to actually add it as well. I'm going to select that. By default, it just comes in with a value of, of one. I'm actually going to bring this up in a separate window again because it's going to make it a little bit easier to see. So I'm going to kind of zoom in on the foot there. And um, what we want for this is, and then actually, it's handy actually that it comes in with one. Because right now, at this particular point, I want it to be at zero. So I'm actually just going to put a keyframe in here and bring that down to the zero line. I can do this more accurately by, by actually entering it numerically there. And then, um, actually, I want it to be, I don't want it to be zero here. I want it to have some value. So I'm going to actually change the value here to, to say, around 30 degrees. So that's going to determine... 
the angle there as as at the back at that part of the stride, and then as his foot lifts up, say around frame five, I'm going to control click here and add another key, and again I'm just going to set that to zero, and then as his foot comes through here, I want it to kind of stay zero for a little bit, so I'm going to add another key here and just oops, make that a zero again. I'm going to fix these tendons a little bit in a moment, and then as his foot lands, I want it to actually go the other way, so I want his foot to kind of come back on his heel. And then after a couple of frames, I want it to flop down on the ground again. So I'm going to put that down to zero. And then again, I'm going to do what I did with the other one. I'm going to link uh, end positions and link end tangents. So now it means I can just grab this and set this to zero. And I'm going to push that a little bit further. I'm going to maybe have him come move this a little bit so he comes back on his heel a little bit more probably a little bit too much so now you got a sense of his foot kind of flapping uh, you'll notice though that it's going to be a little bit messy here because the the, the interpolations so we're going to select this one actually going to select them all and go to points uh, point type soft and then I'm just going to actually going to switch off break tangents as well and I'm going to just flatten these ones out again I'm doing this very quickly really here just to kind of get a rough idea but you know th this is really where you spend the time to kind of polish the motion and get exactly the result you're looking for and then um, I'm going to add one more parameter to it as well I'm going to add um, there's another one on his foot another user data control called um, toe wriggle. So I'm going to add that. And I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to show that in a separate window. And the toe wriggle is the front of his toe. It kind of adds a little bit of flexibility. So at this frame, I want it to be zero. So I'm going to add a key and set that to zero. And then as he lifts up here, say around this, I want this to be the kind of full amount, but I haven't actually set up any amount yet, so I'm going to adjust that here. I want it to come back like this, say, around there. And then as he comes forward, as he comes to kind of putting his foot down, I want to actually go the other way. So I'm going to click that and bring it back. And then as his foot lands, I'm going to maybe have it just come just a couple of frames after. Give him sort of a real floppy sort of feel. And then again, I'm going to just do the... Uh, Link end tangents, link end positions, and I change this one back to zero. So now it's a little bit exaggerated, and I could definitely polish this a lot more, but it's, um, and I could clean up the splines like we do with the other one, but just in the interest of keeping things quick, I'm going to just leave it like that. So that's the basic kind of movement of his foot, and we notice obviously that his left foot hasn't got any of this stuff on it, so what we, what we can do. Um, a nice option is actually add a different type of action to these ones called uh, reference I'm gonna add, I'm actually going to add two of them and the first one I'm going to add the toe uh, the foot roll from the other one actually I'm going to add three of them I need to add one more because I've got I've actually got three that I need to add I've got the uh, the foot um, where is it the leg lift and this one I'm going to add the uh, foot roll and this one I'm going to add the uh, toe wriggle and the handy thing about the reference ones you can see I have no adjustments here for them because they're all driven by by these ones they're kind of clones of them if you like but they're offset how you adjust the offset is actually by selecting the leg and adjusting the phase by default you know, the left leg will be minus 25 this will be 25 so that they kind of sync up so that the cycles kind of match on both sides. And that's an important thing about getting uh, a walk cycle smooth is that you keep everything symmetrical. You know, unless your character is going to limp, unless he's deliberately limping, you want the uh, parameters to be the same on both sides generally. So as I say, this is a very simple animation. Um, what, I, what I would do to make this more organic would be to add motions to the, to the hips and the chest and the head and then offset them using the phase. Um, but just to keep things quick, I'm going to skip over that. I'm just going to look at a couple of examples of what you can do as well. You could uh, you can make 
obviously he's just walking on the spot at the moment, but if I go to say add a few more frames, um just gonna add more than that. Another zero. And um if I I'm gonna un unhide this, I've I've actually got a spline set up here in the scene. At the moment his set walk is set to static, I can put that to a path and um go to a spline path. I've already got a spline created in the scene. And as soon as I do that then he follows along with that path. But you notice he's pretty much trudging along there, <laughs> you know, it's quite slow. So well, a couple of ways you can do that, you can adjust his, his stride length. I'm going to adjust that, maybe make it a bit longer, so he's taking bigger steps, uh, a little bit more even. I'm also going to adjust the time. That's, that's a really nice thing about the C-Motion uh, system, is that you can very quickly experiment with different uh, timings for the, the characters. So I'm going to make that maybe very quick, say so around 15 frames. So now he's really motoring along, and maybe make the stride a little bit longer as well. Kind of both of these will sort of affect how quickly he progresses along. So now he's got sort of a nice sort of, I'd say very, very simple, but kind of a cartoony sort of looking to look to the walk. And really that's why I would recommend starting with a character like this as well. Apart from the, the rigging and the weighting being easier, you can actually get away with a lot more with a character like this than you can with a realistic human, you know. And if you've got a really realistic character, um, you, there's, you've really got to have um, realistic motion on it. There's a, if you, there's a great um, animator called uh, Keith Lango who's got a series of tutorials on the web, and one of the concepts he talks about is the concept of visual harmony, which means that you know, and the motion has to suit the character, and the character has to suit the environment, and all these things have to kind of be in balance. You know, if you look at something like, say, South Park, none of the walk cycles in that are, are anyway natural. You know, the characters just literally bob from side to side as they move. But we we accept it because the characters don't look realistic. Whereas if you looked at Avatar or something like that, you know, the motion for that was largely driven by motion capture because they needed that, you know, ultra fine level of detail and um because the characters were ultra, ultra detailed and, you know, apart from being eight foot tall and blue, they were they were realistic in, in, in many ways. Um so that's really a, a lot of a uh, thing to think about really is that your your character will determine the motion in a lot of cases. And um, another thing we can do as well, just to show you, again, this is one of those things that was covered by Cineversity uh, or some of the tutorials I've done on the cafe as well, I looked at this already, uh, is that you can add um, a route, you can add, um, I've got a landscape object in the scene here, and you can add that into the surface tab here. And now he'll actually walk along that surface. You can press the align tabs or hubs option here, which will mean that his body, if you look at him there, will actually... Uh, kind of um, angle as he walks over the uneven surface. Um, we, we can even adjust this interactively and you'll see a little bit more extreme there. You see he's walking along and he's... The other thing we can adjust is how... You can see his feet are going through the floor there a little bit. We can adjust the offset to control that. You can see that's bringing him up a little bit. It's getting more realistic motion. So really, the, how you how you um, adjust this then will will determine on... will depend on your purpose. Like if you you want something that's, that's easy to reuse, you might just keep it like this and you might go to the uh, object and you might save out the, uh, you can go to the base, you, you can actually save this as a, as a preset and then reuse it on, on the character in another scene. Or you could bake this to, uh, you could set all the controllers and bake them to keyframes using the, uh, if I go to the uh, timeline, if I select one of his controllers, um, actually I might go into full hierarchy. I'm just going to stop him walking there for a moment. And I'm going to just turn off show animated. And um, actually, this is going to be easier. If I just go to the character object and go to display object controllers, and say if I drag in his left, his right leg, there's no animation at the moment, but I could go to functions, bake objects, uh, turn off create copy and clean tracks, and just bake it for the keyframe range. And then I can do that for all the controllers. And then I can turn off the Z motion uh, tag object and then he'll be driven by the keyframes or you could do the same thing with the uh, motion clips system and that's a way of um, then blending different animations together or, or refining them further in, in the kind of more traditional uh, keyframe uh, way rather than the C motion system. So it's a great system I think really for kind of blocking things out quickly and for kind of experimenting but um, my, for my own uh, purposes I, I find I'm more of a keyframe guy so I like to kind of bake things back to keyframes and adjust them that way. So I'm running low on time here. I have a couple of minutes left. I just want to look at, um, just again, just to go over a couple of little principles. 
that might help you if you're trying to put a walk together and you're wondering, you know, why doesn't it look natural? What what should I be looking for? That's really the thing with animation that, you know, you can sort of try and you can sort of fiddle with settings and, but if you know what you're going for, um, it really helps you. And that, really, that, a lot of that comes down to looking at reference. And uh, so I'm going to look at a couple of example files here. Um, I've got a walk reference movie here. And this is just a simple movie, just some people walking by the camera here. And you can see, if you look at some books, a great book actually on the subject is uh, The Animator Survival Kit by uh, Richard Williams. And uh, he talks about, he divides, uh, a lot of animators do this, they divide a walk into four key poses. And uh, the, the first pose most people block in first is what they call a contact pose, which is basically this pose here and this this guy, the, the red t-shirt. He's um, His heel is just contacting the ground here. It's not coming down yet. He's not really showing much weight yet. His leg is kind of straight. His back leg is just lifting off the ball of the foot. So that's kind of the first pose people put in. And his left leg is forward, or his right leg in this case, and his left arm is forward. His, you can't see his right arm is back and his his left foot is back, so the arms and, and feet, the hips and, and chest as well will tend to, to uh, oppose each other. And then the next pose that's kind of important to get in there is what's called a down pose. Unfortunately, there's a bit of a motion blur there, but you can sort of see what's going on. His front foot is flattened down the ground, his knee is starting to bend, his hips are kind of coming down, the weight is coming down on, on his leg. His back foot, though, is still on the ground. That's one of the things that the C-Motion system won't do by default. Usually, if you've got just a sine wave, his foot will already be off the ground on this at this stage, which that's one of the things that, that doesn't make it look natural. So you've got to kind of put that in there, get the keyframes to kind of make sure his foot stays on the ground a little bit longer, and it kind of rolls forward on the toe. I might go to another frame here where you can see it with less blur. Yeah, you can see it there. You can see that his foot is still on the on the ground there, but it's kind of rolling right off the toe, and it'll continue to do that. You know, it'll... You know, you can say it's fighting the war against gravity, if you like. It's it's going to resist lifting up until the very last moment, and then it's going to lift up. And then we get to the next main pose of the walk, which is kind of arbitrary. It could be here, or you could say it's here. Um, but basically what they call this is the, is the passing pose, um, which is kind of an important pose. It's basically where the leg is, the planted leg is pretty much straight. The other leg is lifted off the ground. The arms are kind of in the middle of their, of their swing. And the next pose, then, that's kind of important to put in there, is often called a peak pose. Uh, you can see uh, on a human, we don't really lift our feet up very high, but on a cartoon character, you probably exaggerate this and bring his feet right, foot right up, you know, to kind of show kind of energy and, and, and excitement, enthusiasm, that kind, of, that kind of quality. So that's often called a peak or the up pose, and then it comes back into the down pose again. And you can see the girl there behind him, she's, her, her, leg, her stance is going to be a little bit different. Obviously, she's going to be more feminine in her movements. But the basic poses are still there. Her contact pose would be this. You can see her, because of her high heels, she's, her foot is still pretty much flat, on the, her back foot is pretty much flat there. And then it's going to lift up onto the toe. It's kind of obscured a little bit by this guy's leg. And she comes, but her, her foot is probably still planted there as uh, rolling onto the toe. And then she comes into the, the passing pose, and then the peak pose, and then the plant again, the, the, the contact. And uh, it's really an important thing of animation, really, is just looking at reference. You know, you can film yourself or you can go on YouTube and look look at reference for, for a particular action that you're trying to animate. And so I'm running very low on time. I'm just going to show you a couple of examples then. of um, These are some walk cycles I've animated. And actually, the first one I'm going to look at is a run cycle. But this will uh, this will illustrate some of the... Um, I'm actually going to turn off uh, nulls and splines so we can see them a little bit better. And uh, this is a kind of a cartoony kind of run cycle. <coughs> Excuse me. I animated this. Um, I actually rigged this guy during the R12 beta stage to kind of test out some of the new character tools in R12. And um, you can see there a couple of the principles we're looking at in the um, in the other the, the animation principles section of this, where we um, actually had his arm. You know, his arm is kind of it's bent here, and it's then as his arm, as his upper arm swings forward, his his lower arm kind of straightens out it's like it's lagging behind the motion sort of like that that tail example and then again here this arm will kind of get to this pose earlier than the, the upper arm will get earlier than will end up at that pose earlier than the lower part so you can see that this part is stopped it's almost starting to move back now whereas this arm is still following through or that this limb i should say is still following through 
and again it's going to kind of lag behind the motion and then straighten out again as it comes through so see that goes a long way to adding a little bit of flexibility to the to the arms you'll notice i didn't do too much with the with the hands because i wanted them to feel kind of strong you know he's kind of uh moving with a lot of purpose if he was a more laid back sort of loose character i would have loosened his wrists up a lot more and again you'll see his uh his foot is really staying in contact with the ground and then it just pops off in one frame you know, that's kind of a, again a, a spacing issue where you're kind of looking at how the motion kind of transitions from pose to pose uh, i'm kind of going over time here so i'm just going to look at these last few examples really quickly um just point out a couple of little points about each one and um, this is a kind of a kind of a stylized kind of model walk couple of interesting things about this one is uh, one thing that her, her arms aren't symmetrical at all you know her arm one arm is basically constrained to her hips the other thing that's kind of interesting about a female walk is that the legs i'm really exaggerating it here but the legs will tend to follow almost like a tightrope you know they won't swing out very much on the passing pose but on the contact and all the in-between poses they'll stay really almost like she's walking on a, on a tightrope you'll see most of the swing here will come from the pelvis and the hips to give a sort of a feminine sort of feel the upper body though will have very little sway and the head will have very little up and down there is a little bit but in the model walk particularly i looked at some references of models the heads tend to keep looking forward i suppose the whole thing is to illustrate the the clothes that they're wearing so they really keep the movement quite quite subdued in many ways and of course this is sort of a cartoon version of that and then a couple of other examples this is uh when i did a couple of years back actually this is here we've got them sort of very sort of stylized kind of sort of people have got a sort of an attitude walker is really kind of uh it's emphasizing this this first pose and the last one and the kind of the swing through the middle end is a lot quicker it's kind of staying in this pose for most of the cycle almost so that's again a, a spacing kind of thing um another one then this is a very different looking one this is um another cycle again but in this case He's actually coming down on the ball of his foot or his toe almost and landing very slowly then um, on his heel because he's trying to sneak up on his victim. And there are a couple of quick ones. We've got a double bounce walk here. This is kind of based on the 1920s sort of feel. If you look at some of the really early Disney stuff, uh, you know, Mickey Mouse, all that kind of thing. There, he's, his hips are actually going up and down twice per cycle here, which is completely unrealistic. But in you know, in the world of cartoons, it gives sort of a um, really optimistic sort of happy sort of feel to his motion another thing that's interesting about this one is that if you look at his elbows as they swing forward on the kind of passing pose they're actually going backwards his elbows actually leading the motion which looks weird in uh as you, as you frame through but it really gives a sense of this is as is driving the motion and this is kind of lagging behind so it gives a nice sort of energetic sort of feel to it so in motion it works and so if you frame through it looks kind of weird we're trying to give a nice sort of happy sort of attitude and uh, the last couple of examples then we've got this was kind of an interesting one this is um sort of a star wars model and here you've got a lot of side to side to kind of suit the the really big stride and the big foot movement that we've got uh, and then i've got a realistic cat here and here you can see one of the interesting thing about this one is how that the how the uh the paws will tend to really stay parallel to the ground almost and just flip forward on the last moment and kind of peel onto the ground almost. And um, I've got another cat here. This is one I rigged myself. It's actually a model who rigged and textured this quite recently. And this one, we've got a much more cartoony animation. So you can see with this one, the, uh, the motion is a lot more stylized and a lot more pushed than it was on the realistic cat. And again, that's going back to what I was saying earlier about you know exaggerating to suit your character and the last uh, couple of ones then this one is pushing that uh, that cartoony idea even further like this is not realistic in the slightest but you know with the type of character he's got a displacement map here which kind of looks a bit strange in the viewport but it renders nicely um but you'll see that the motion is uh is very kind of um stylized you know real hippos don't move like this at all but in sort of an ardman sort of feel like it, this, this kind of works pretty well and the one last one then this is actually just a movie and this is i was kind of learning how to do um match moving a little while ago um and i animated this uh, dinosaur skeleton 
And a lot of the principles I've been talking about in the, uh, the other ones here are, are, are at work here. If you look at his hips, his hips are really what's driving the motion and his tail, his body and, and his head are kind of lagging behind there. And that helps give a little bit of a sense of weight. You know, obviously he's only like, you know, six inches tall here, but I'm kind of still animating him as if he's like a full-size dinosaur. You can see his his um, his feet don't stay on, off the ground very long. That's another thing that kind of shows a bit of weight. And then they kind of flop on the ground and his, his toes kind of spread out, which again helps show a little bit of weight. So I've gone a little bit over time there, but um, I hope that was interesting. And I um, hope this gives you some ideas and we can answer some questions now if you've got any. So thanks a million. Thank you.